So welcome, Minister. I think you're on. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now we're at the highlight. <laughs> right, I'd like to introduce to you now Mr. Stephen O'Brien, MP. Um, he was uh, he's parliamentary under Secretary of State for International Development, and of course that's what we're we're all talking about. Um, Stephen was appointed as parliamentary under Secretary of State uh, following last year's election. He's been the Conservative Member of Parliament for Edisbury since 1999. And he um, was the founder and chairman of the all-party group on malaria and neglected tropical diseases. Uh, also of the Tanzania group, which is uh, his country of birth, I understand, yes. Uh, and he's vice chairman of the all-party aid, trade and debt group. So, Minister, we're delighted to welcome you here at last. <laughs> Thank you. Please, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and uh, the old gentleman. And I'm very pleased to, uh, to see you all. And uh, I do apologise. Uh, we've actually walked the last bit. The traffic was so abominable. And all I can say is I'm very pleased that I'm responsible for international development, because there's nothing I can do about the roads at the moment and the traffic. Um, now, it's obviously a very important uh, day that you're having and a uh, very important subject, and I'm absolutely thrilled to see so many of you here and engaged uh, on it. And uh, that was reflected recently in the House of Commons debate to celebrate the centenary of International Women's Day. Uh, I was delighted to be able to celebrate the great strides which have been made in the recognition and promotion of women's rights over the last 100 years. Yet, despite these advances, we are still faced with enormous challenges. Every year, over a third of a million women die from avoidable deaths in pregnancy and childbirth. Globally, 10 million more girls are out of school than boys. And as we face new and increasing challenges of climate change and the global financial crisis, it's girls and women in the poorest countries who are hit the hardest. Girls and women continue to bear the disproportionate burden of global poverty. Yet evidence shows us that investing in girls and women makes sound economic sense and is critical to achieving the MDGs, which I'm sure you've heard about a lot of this morning. Uh, I saw on the schedule Barbara Stocking was due to talk to you about that. Yes, there you are, Barbara. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, um, better educated women earn more, have lower fertility rates and healthier children, benefiting girls and women themselves, their families, communities, and economies. And it doesn't matter how many countries of sub-Saharan Africa I travel around. I've been to 14 in the last 10 months. And it's true in each and every single one of those. And we're absolutely focused on putting our programs through uh, women and children first, because we can see how quickly the efforts are rewarded by success, uh, and much broader than just for those individuals. It's their families and those communities. And above all, the economic driver that's going to lead most people out of poverty. So we must seize each and every opportunity as it arises. New opportunities such as the innovative use of mobile phones and the internet are now playing an important role in enabling girls and women to do business more efficiently, get the skills and information they need, and hold decision makers to account. The creation of UN Women is an important step in enabling the international system to deliver for girls and women. At the launch of UN Women on the 24th of February, the UK government welcomed the agency and set out its high hopes for this new body. We're already providing transitional support to make sure it gets off to the strongest possible start. And we're all part of the global big society, and it is as much in our interests as it is our moral duty to get involved in, in tackling the tremendous challenges which face girls and women in developing countries. I'm delighted that so many of you are doing this through participating in the Women Reaching Women project. And I know that many of you in your partnership with Oxfam and the Everyone Foundation have been involved in developing learning resources and leading or taking part in training days. Crucially, you've also been learning what actions you can take to contribute to improving the lives of some of the world's poorest women and sharing this knowledge with your communities. So my department has put girls and women at the front and centre of all our business. 
On International Women's Day last month, we launched a new strategic vision for girls and women to drive forward action that will bring transformational changes to the lives of girls and women in the poorest countries. And we've identified four areas where we want to see dramatic changes. We're committed to delaying first pregnancy and supporting safe childbirth to getting girls through primary and secondary schooling, to getting economic assets directly to girls and women, and preventing violence against girls and women. And as those who have heard me speak before, I can never resist to go off piste half the time, which is terribly frustrating and worrying for my officials when they have got a very carefully prepared speech for me. Um, but it was really striking, in fact very moving, to see on the hills above Kigali in Rwanda where we have a big social protection programme, very much focused on girls and women, putting into practice what these words say. And in addition to the social protection, where you give actual cash transfer, something which people have been nervous about, but actually work. If you're very poor, you do spend it on the right things. And it enables the food to, uh, to actually reach children's mouths. And then, if there's any kind of spare cash, the mother will tend to use it to buy shoes for the children or to buy that bit of medical cover that's required or to enable them to get into school. But once you get beyond that and you move to the next level, which is the group of them doing all their hoeing of these fantastic new terraces, and as you know, Rwanda, it's the country of a thousand hills, so everything's on the hills. You need terraces to increase the agricultural uh, growing space. And they make these fantastic things, they get a bit of cash. But the next thing that happens is what do they do? Goodness me, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Um, I'm about to illuminate the whole thing. Um, but uh, once they've got the cash, they, of course, that does give them the means to, uh, to make their own choices, to be a little bit more liberated, to actually have something to use for their own uh, family. But the third area, which was what I wanted to mention, is the women, and, and particularly it was the women, uh, in fact, I didn't see any men around on this one, um, were in a small social enterprise of very small little chickens they were going to grow, which they'd be able to both have for eggs and for the meat, and also rabbits, likewise, for the meat. And there's a small farming enterprise which had just started in some uh, make-do cages. And so I then, after all the wonderful singing and dancing and the welcome and so forth had finished, I then asked one of the, the ladies in the lineup. I said, what would you do with the first bit of cash, first dividend you get back from this business? And she looked me straight in the eye as I had asked the most stupid question. But I got the best answer I've had so far in 10 months. She said, well, of course, I shall immediately lend this to another woman in the valley so she can do exactly the same. You know, talk about the cascade and the empowerment that that gives, but also she'd already learned that lesson so quickly that this was a means to an end. It wasn't just an end in itself. And that's, to be honest with you, I've not had that response from a man. Now, um, I hear mumbles down here, surprise, surprise, but um, <laughs> it's what we call from a sedentary position. Um, anyway, uh, let me carry on, back on to what the officials will regard as much safer territory. Um, in all our work, uh, we're giving new priority to adolescent girls. And we know that if girls have choice and control over decisions during adolescence, their life chances improve. They're better able to delay pregnancy and marriage, complete school and gain life skills. This creates a virtuous circle that helps to prevent the transmission of poverty from one generation to the next, driving lasting change within societies. And that's why it's absolutely vital that as we're doing in Nigeria, in Sierra Leone, in Ghana, and I've seen with my own eyes, when you're doing a schooling programme, it is also building the latrines, obviously having teachers' houses as well to make sure they attend. Because when a girl at an adolescent age hits menstruation, it's the embarrassment factor more than anything else which stops them going to school. And so having the latrines enables them to have that chance and get beyond that crucial moment when their family pressure would be to get them married off and to start pregnancy. And so that would be uh, something which is often overlooked when people say schooling. It's actually, you can't just build the classroom. It's crucial that the design is focused on what keeps girls at school. So tackling violence against girls and women is a top priority for us and for the whole of Whitehall. Here in Diffid, we've produced a strategy for tackling this issue at home and abroad. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has appointed my colleague in the coalition, Lynn Featherstone, as the government's ministerial champion for tackling violence against girls and women overseas, an indication of our commitment 
at the highest levels to tackle this abhorrent human rights abuse. Our strategic vision also highlights our commitment to delay first pregnancy and support safe childbirth. And I'm pleased, I have to say, to receive copies of your Mums Matter campaign petition. You can be sure of the coalition government's commitment to improve maternal health, and we're determined to tackle the scandal of women dying in childbirth. In fact, it was one of my constituents who was part of the Pramble that I think was organised by Oxfam, and I was presented with this enormous Perspex box, which had been dropped, actually, so it was all falling apart. It was stuck together so tight, with lots of cubes of messages in it, which was fantastic, uh, as all part of this tremendous campaign. And in December last year, following the Millennium Development Goals Re Review Summit, we launched a framework for results for improving reproductive, maternal and newborn health called Choices for Women, Planned Pregnancies, Safe Births and Healthy Newborns. The framework sets out how we will save the lives of at least 50,000 women during pregnancy and childbirth and 250,000 newborn babies by 2015. A colleague in uh, Oxfam, they're now working very hard down in Maryland near the coast where you can only supply by sea to a place called Harper. And it's really important to recognise that it'll be the women and children who for quite a long time, it's not a temporary blip just because Cote d'Ivoire may be resolving itself, for a long time it'll be women and children in these camps. The men may go back and forth a bit, checking on their bits of farm and so forth, but it's the women and children, so providing educational services and so forth are absolutely vital, and which is why we need to push the multilateral organisations to recognise how central services to women and girls are in making sure that we meet the needs and particularly those who are most vulnerable. So how will we know when we've succeeded? We will know we've succeeded when girls are routinely going to secondary school in the countries we're supporting, when maternal mortality rates and the age at which adolescent girls and women first give birth are falling, when girls and women have access to economic assets, including land, and are able to make productive use of them, when fewer women suffer violence, and most importantly, when women and girls themselves tell us that their lives have improved. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Minister, for telling us all that. And I'm so glad that uh, the messages that you're passing on have all been you know, based on analysed thinking. That's what we need. <laughs> exactly. Um, and especially the one line I really took from that, which, which heartens me so much, is that the, the increase in the value of girls and women Absolutely. in every um, aspect. Our Women Reaching Women project um, has brought many of the challenging challenges that face women uh, in the developing world very vividly to life for our WI members. And maternal health has been one of the particular ones that we've uh, focused on. Um, and I know actually from my own uh, visit to Malawi just how important strong leadership is on this issue. So, um, and it's important, I think, that the aid spending keeps on, as you've promised us that it will. We heard it, didn't we, ladies and <laughs> gentlemen? So, it's a promise. Yeah, so, well, with that promise, it, would it be all right now if I handed over all our signatures to you? I think you're going to accept them, are you not? I on hope I'm the enough w to carry them all. <laughs> I have to just go down. Okay, very good, Ruth. <laughs> Very good. And that's because mums matter. Thank they you. certainly do. Thank, Thank you very much. Right. So there we are. The box is handed over. Good WI green, you see. <laughs> and so that brings us to the end of this morning's session. Um, so much to think about. Uh, I don't think it'll ever leave us. So thank you to everyone who, everybody who has contributed. Thank you, Minister, for coming hot foot, on foot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, please do go and enjoy your lunch now. And we'll be back at 1 o'clock. Uh, 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock, sorry. It's 1 o'clock now, isn't it? <laughs> oh, dear. Enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>